Okay, hello everyone. Well, I want to talk about my all-time favorite science discovery and some problems that arise from it, Rule 30. So last week I announced uh, prizes, $30,000 worth of prizes for answering seemingly straightforward questions about a creature that I first encountered nearly 40 years ago now, Rule 30. So I should probably start off by explaining what Rule 30 is. It's an example of a cellular automaton, and we can uh, see how it works by doing this. We can just say, show the rules for the cellular automaton. And these rules say we have a line of black and white cells, and at every step, we color a particular cell based on the color of the cell above it and to its left and right. Okay, so that's the rule. So now what we do is we say, take that cellular automaton, let's start it off with just uh, a single one, and let's run it for, let's say, 20 steps, and let's show the result. Okay, here it is. So let's, let's see how this worked. All right, so let's take that cell there. So that cell there, is underneath a black, white, white configuration. Black, white, white gives black, and so that's black. Let's look down here. That cell there that's white, above it is a black, 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 gives white. Okay, so that's, uh, that's rule 30. You know, one thing I realized I forgot to mention in the, um, uh, and my explanation of rule 30 here is what it is in terms of um, uh, Boolean algebra. So we can say, uh, if we think about these as bits, uh, trues and falses, we can say Boolean function, and this is a uh, three argument Boolean function. I think that goes like this. We say, um, Kth Boolean function and three variables. Okay, so there it is. So that's Boolean function. If we say make the truth table for that, well, actually, if we can just say make the rule plot for that, we'll see it's the exact same function. Now, what we could do if we want to is we say for this, so we can make that as a function of PQ and R, and we can say Boolean minimize. And we might just do that by default. So there it is as ands and ors. Uh, and um, so the um, uh, the actual, the minimal version of it, uh, I can show you. It is a an or and an xor. Let's see whether we can actually get it to do that here. Um, we would say something like, let's see what happens if we say XOR here. Oops. Um, ah, dear, dear, dear. So this is what happens. If I start exploring, I immediately um, start dealing with things that, um, oh, so ANF is what I want. Okay. So that's P, XOR, Q, XOR, R, XOR, Q and R, so that's another form for Rule 30. But um, uh, you can represent it in terms of, a, you can represent this rule in terms of a Boolean function, and you're just applying that function over and over again here. Okay, so what would we like to know about this? Well, let's look at the center column of cells here. So let's, first of all, let's look at what happens if we run it a bit longer. Um, let's run it for 200 steps, and what we see happen, is that even though it's a very simple rule, there it is, very simple initial condition, what we get out looks pretty complicated. And for example, over on the left, there's some regularity. Over on the right, if you look at the very, very edge, it's periodic, it's just black, 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 black. One step in, it's already alternating, and then it quickly gets to be uh, increasingly uh, long before it repeats. But the real 
center of a problem is the center column here. And we can just look at the sequence of values in that center column. And um, the uh, uh, so we can compute that here if I just say generate the center column, sequence of values in the center column. I just say there, I want 200 steps and I just want the center column out. And I think this should do it. There we go. And so the question is, what can we say about that center column? And for example, let's generate, I don't know, let's generate 10,000 steps of the center column. And let's say C 10,000, let's say uh, C uh, four for 10 to the four is this. And um, then we could say, for example, let's just take, uh, accumulate two times C four minus one, that will kind of give us a random walk. And then let's say list line plot of that. That will kind of show us every time there's a one, it'll go up. Every time there's a, a, a minus one, it'll go down. So that's showing us kind of a, a, a sign of the randomness of that center column. Or for example, we could just say make counts of C4. Let's compare the counts of ones and zeros. They seem roughly the same. Um, okay, so uh, what I have been curious about for a very long time is what can we actually prove about the center column of cells? And so far, we know basically nothing. Empirically, we know lots of stuff. Empirically, we know the center column of cells looks completely random with respect to all kinds of statistical and other uh, uh, sort of um, uh, tests of randomness. But we don't know anything, really. So the three problems that I uh, have identified that uh, I'm offering $10,000 each for solutions to these is the first one is, does the center column always remain non-periodic or does it eventually repeat? Does each color occur equally often? So one and zero occur equally often. And the third, slightly more difficult to explain problem is if you want to compute the nth cell here, uh, can you do that more quickly than by just going ahead and computing every step in the evolution? Well, actually, I'm asking something even sh even tighter than that. I'm asking, can you kind of just jump ahead and figure out what the nth cell will be without using at least about n operations to do it? You know, if you if you just compute this pattern here, you'll actually use n squared or n squared over two operations because to uh, to get the nth row, not only do you have to go junk 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 down n times, but by the nth row the width of it is 2n, 2n plus 1, actually. Um, and so that means that the number of operations, the number of times you have to apply this rule, goes up like n squared. But this is asking, this problem here is asking, does computing the nth cell, uh, can it be done in less than uh, order n steps? So, OK, those are the problems. And, uh, you know, the statement is very simple, yet uh, really in nearly 40 years, uh, we haven't made any progress in answering any of these questions. As a practical matter, we've used the results. So for example, for a long time, the randomness of the center column of rule 30 was used as the random integer, random number generator in Wolfram language. So actually, if you go um, look up um, random integer, uh, one of the methods for random integer, um, uh, method to seed, up, seed random, okay. Um, one of the methods here is the rule 30 CA. Um, and that, uh, in fact, the way that's done, because we don't want to, we're, we're basically sampling the center column, but we're not sampling the center column of an infinite width pattern, which is what this is. We're sampling the column of uh, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the, a finite width pattern. And when you have a finite width pattern, I mean, if I were to do this with, um, let's imagine I just say, um, let's just imagine that I make this a uh, center array with a single one. And I want, um, let's say 40 width 40, then that's what it looks like. And eventually, oops, I wanted to say width 40 there. Um, eventually, 
let, let's do this with like width 10. Um, eventually, as you can see there, it repeats. And in general, if you have width n, it has to repeat after at most two to the n steps, two to the n minus one steps. In practice, rule 30 repeats after about two to the power 0.61 steps. But that's still enough that for reasonably large n, we can use it as a good generator of random numbers. So you might ask of these problems, uh, well, what evidence do we have about them? Well, for example, we've, um, uh, we've computed a billion bits. That's actually not, uh, uh, you can actually use the, the built-in cellular automaton function in Wolfram language is pretty efficient. And it, it can readily crank out a million bits quite quickly because uh, we were kind of uh, rushing to get a billion bits in time for the announcement of this prize. We actually broke down and, and uh, used custom GPU code to get to the billion bits. And it took a couple of days only at that point to do it. Um, but with a billion bits, we can start asking uh, what can we say about um, what can we say about what happens with a billion bits? And um, uh, I should first of all say that the billion bits are available in um, uh, in our data repository. Um, it's just uh, resource data of this billion bits thing. So we can go ahead. It's probably going to be really slow. Let me do it with a million bits just to show you um, just to show you kind of what happens. Um, so let's say I pick up my uh, million bits here. So here's my million bits. And then I just go over here and I say, uh, let's call it, um, to be consistent, let's call it C6, the 10 to the 6 list of these things. OK, so this is now going to load in. Oh, it was already loaded here. OK, so let's check the length. Well, let's do accounts here. So we can say counts of C6. Uh, and that will tell us the relative number of zeros and ones. So it's really close to being an equal number of zeros and ones. But our problem is, can we prove that on the limit of an infinite number of uh, cells that it's exactly 50, 50, zero and one? Okay, and we, we can do all kinds of other things. We could test, you know, is it periodic? Is that million bit thing periodic? Actually, let's, let's fi say, find transient repeat, C6. Um, and uh, actually, I don't want to print out the results here. Let's say we want to make it, see whether it can find the, uh, so this is going to be searching for a repeat. And um, uh, it's going to say, how long is the transient? How long is the repeat? OK, so it didn't succeed in finding, oh, 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 actually, I, <laughs> that's interesting. Let's take a look at the very end of this. Let's take a look at the first 10 bits. Aha. So it did find what it thought was happening in this 10 to the 6 bit sequence was that it had this number, 999,993 things that didn't repeat. And then at the very end, it said it had four things that repeated. So this is a little bit tricky. So let's ask it to look for, um, let's say, some more repeats. Let's say I'm only going to count it as a repeat if it repeats 10 times. OK, so if we do that. And then we say, um, how long is the transient? How long is the repeat? It's going to say the transient is of length a million. In other words, it never found a repeat. And the repeat is of length zero. And we could do all kinds of things. Like we could, for example, we could say, let's try this. Let's split that thing into sequences of zeros and ones. And then let's ask it to, so that's going to make it into, that, that's going to, if I do this, let's, let's do it for the C4 case. Um, so that's going to split it into sequences of, of ones, followed by sequences of zeros, followed by sequences of ones, and so on. And so we could ask questions like, what's the longest sequence that we get in there? So um, uh, if we split, well, in this case, we could just say, hmm, let's see. We could say, uh, well, we could just say um, the length of those. And we could say, for example, let's say the count of the lengths of those. OK, so that's saying that there's a 1 length 13 sequence of identical elements and a, a bunch of much shorter sequences of identical elements. Mm. And in fact, if we say, um, let's sort those. So that's saying 
most often we have a sequence of length one, then about half the, that often we have a sequence of length two and so on. Okay, so we can try all sorts of tests of randomness. Um, and uh, well, I've, all the ones I've tried, it's passed. Actually, I think we have a nice collection of new tests for randomness. Um, if we look in our new function repository, um, we have a bunch of tests for randomness that have been provided there. Let's see if we can look for that. Um, Assuming that the search is working well. Okay, there we go. So we've got things like spectral randomness test, run count randomness test, all kinds of um, run length randomness test, all sorts of um, uh, randomness tests, which actually should be run on. So I mean, if we say, um, Okay, so this is a sequence. So what we want to do is to run a chi-square test here. So this is now saying chi-square randomness test, let's run it on C4. And it's gonna to have to load in the function and it's gonna tell us, okay, the p-value. So that's telling us the probability, um, let's see what the interpretation is here. Um, okay, is, and returns a p-value for whether it is random. Tests the sequence for equidistribution and returns the p-value. Um, so, or for example, we could try here, we could say, let's test, let's do another one of these tests. Let's do, um, let's do one, one that might be interesting, an arc sign law randomness test. Okay, so same thing, we can just run this and ask for whether, how it does the, oh, wow. Um, I don't actually know how to read that. I mean, I, I what we could do here, okay. So, so that, that those are some examples of of what happens when we run randomness tests here. Let's ask for some analogies to this problem. So, one obvious analogy, uh, we're asking, you know, how random is the sequence of bits? We could ask how random are the digits of pi. So, let's say we generate digits of pi to a thousand digits of pi. Okay, there they are. We could generate them if we wanted to. Um, we could generate these digits in binary. So we could say real digits of pi in base two, let's say the first thousand digits in binary. So there they are. And that's then a sequence that we can sort of compare to the sequence we're dealing with here. And the thing about the digits of pi is there have now been about 30 trillion of them generated. And although there haven't been incredibly elaborate randomness tests done on the very large number of digits of pi, um, there have been tests of randomness done um, on uh, uh, up to billions of digits of pi. And so far, um, nothing has ever seemed to be non-random in the digits of pi. So one question you can ask is, well, can the digits of pi ever repeat? That's one thing we can absolutely answer because the only numbers who, that have digits that repeat are rational numbers. So if I say, for example, you know, what's one over 181, and I look at that to 300 uh, digits, you'll see this is kind of a cute one because it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 9, but it eventually repeats. And every rational number has a digit sequence which repeats in any base. But can you say any more about it? Like, for example, could you say for pi that in base 2, it has an equal number of zeros and ones? Absolutely not. Nobody's been able to say anything like that. Um, can you say, um, uh, pretty much any other sort of statistical fact about the digits of pi, nobody knows anything. And um, uh, so one question you can ask is, are there sort of things like naturally occurring numbers about which you can say anything? Well, there's kind of one class of examples. There's a thing called the Champanone number, um, which is a number that, let's let's look at what that is. If we look at it, um, if we just uh, look at, let's say, 200 digits of the Champanon number. Oops, oh, I'm wrong here. I need to say what base I want to do this in. So let's say base 10. Okay, so that number goes point one two three four five six seven eight nine one zero one 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 two one three one four one five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look at the digits of the base two 
Champanone number, so it'll just be zeros and ones. Um, let's look at, okay, so we want the base two Champanone number. Um, and uh, oh, let's see, what do we want to do here? We want to say digits in base two, let's say 100 digits in base two. Okay, so what we'll see is one, one, zero, one, one, uh, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. So it's the, it's the numbers in base two counting up. Okay, so if we now ask for, uh, let's see, we just want to get the first of this, so it's the mantissa of the thing. Um, we now can ask, for example, for counts of this. Um, and, okay, well, that was because we didn't, let's try going to 128. Ah, interesting, very interesting. So we know that eventually the fraction of ones and zeros will converge. So actually, let's look at something. I'm now curious. Um, we can either compute this from the Champanon number, or we could just say uh, generate integer digits of n base 2, and let's make a table of integer digits base 10 uh, going up to n goes to, let's say, 2 to the, um, let's just say 2 to the 8. Um, and then I want to flatten this out, and that will give us a bunch of digits here. And now I could say I could do that same counts thing. So that's this is now claimed to be something. Wow, that's pretty weird, actually. This should be a number that has the property that every digit occurs with equal frequency eventually. So let's take a look at how that works. So what we're going to do, let, let's just look at the successive ratios. Actually, we could go ahead and look here at that same thing we computed before. 2 times that thing minus 1, accumulate it, and do a list, list, list line plot. Um, oh, very cute. OK, so it's a, it's a weird scalloped thing. But it turns out it should be the case that the number of ones and zeros should, on average, be equal. So this means that eventually, let's take a look at what this does. So let's go out to 10 to the 10. Humphrey hump, what am I doing wrong? Well, it better be the case that, oh, maybe I'm, am I doing something wrong here? This is an example of a so-called normal number, which has the property that every block of ones and zeros should occur with equal frequency. But I think the issue here is that I've got it's prejudiced towards ones because the leading digit of each of these of, uh, is is always a one. So if I say rest here, I think we'll get a very different result. Yeah, there we get a result which keeps on. Um, so that's something where we're we're cutting off the leading one there. I have to admit I'm a little confused by this. Um, and. Uh, um, now I'm embarrassed that I, I, I'm very confused by what's happened here. Um, let me let me just show you. So so for rule 30, um, some things we know about rule 30. Okay. So if we go um, uh, to my um, big book, uh, needless to say, on page 30, ha ha, is a picture of rule 30. That's page 29. There's a bigger picture on page 30. Isn't that cute? Um, and uh, OK, so if we look at the notes here in the book, it has some facts about Rule 30. Um, and um, uh, by the way, that's the form of Rule 30, big XOR of the left bit or the middle bit and the right bit. And I have to embarrassingly say that I need to mention that. And um, I should uh, put, put that in my blog post. And I think I forgot to say that. It's kind of a nice fact about, about Rule 30. Um, and uh, um, that that's, that's the simple form that it has. OK, so um, really, in the case of uh, do all cells occur equally often? Sort of no naturally occurring, for example, digit sequence is known to have that property. There are sequences one can generate. 
that have that property, but they don't sort of occur in sort of an integrated way. Um, and uh, um, the um, yeah, the, this this particular pattern um, from the Champanon number is a nice self-similar pattern. Um, the uh, okay, but it's very different from the Rule Thirty pattern. In the in the case of Rule Thirty, um, that's what we get, it's it's uh, looks much more like a random walk. Um, and from what we can tell, it really is uh, basically a random walk. And if we, if we look, for example, at the um, uh, um, at the sequence of um, um, uh, the the, at, um, uh, the the how frequently zeros and ones occur um, at different uh, lengths. What we will see is that um, um, let's see. We'll see the that the that what we get is that's a table that shows how frequently um, zeros and ones occur um, up to a billion bits. That's the number of ones that occur. That's the number of zeros that occur. So the ratio is incredibly close to one. Uh, but can we prove that it's exactly one? Um, so I don't know what kind of mathematics might be able to do this. Um, there are some facts that we know about Rule 30. Um, we know some facts about uh, sort of the local behavior inside Rule 30. We know facts about the left-hand edge of Rule 30. But all the facts we know about the left-hand edge of Rule 30 are um, facts that um, have to do with the, uh, the, for example, we know that the, um, um, uh, that on the um, uh, left edge, it is very close to periodic. So we can see that if we take a rule 30, let, let's say we just take one of these things here, let's do this. And let's take a look at the left and right edges. Okay, so let's look at this. And then let's say, how do I think about this? I want to uh, trim out the zeros on the left. How would I do that? I would say, uh, one thing I could do is I could say, um, rotate left by an amount that is, um, Let's try this. I could say map indexed, rotate left. Let's live dangerously. I wonder if this is going to work. Um, that should be at every successive step, uh, making it go further. I think I wanted to say rotate right. Um, OK, so that's showing me the left-hand edge. That's showing me the pattern. Uh, after I've kind of rotated it right. So that's showing me the left-hand edge, and it's showing me that on the left-hand edge, things become periodic, right? And it's showing, in fact, that there's a line of separation between the periodicity on the left and the randomness in the middle. And um, that line uh, goes at a speed of about 0.25 um, steps per uh, per time step. And actually, I have to show you a little bit of Rule 30 history. It's kind of fun. Um, when I first started studying Rule 30, um, I asked everybody I knew uh, if they could figure out what was going on with Rule 30. And let's see if I can just pull this up here. Um, one, um, uh, one person who um, uh, had um, interesting things to say was a physicist named Dick Feynman. It's a picture of me with him, but this is, oops, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to go down to those. This is, um, these are some notes uh, that Dick Feynman made trying to, trying to compute the rate. This was back in 1984, um, trying to compute the, uh, uh, the rate of the wiggling of that line between sort of order and chaos. I mean, if we look up at one of these pictures here, let me make a bigger picture of this. If we make, for example, a, um, let's make a picture with, um, let's make one with a thousand cells across. Okay, so here, if I make it a bit bigger, you can probably see there 
maybe just about, you can see this kind of line between sort of order on the left and chaos on the right. And that line has kind of a random walk, but it's not an unbiased random walk that equally goes left or right. It's a biased random walk that goes about 0.25 cells per time step to the left. And uh, there's a little argument that one can give that, uh, that Dick Feynman worked out. If you assume certain kinds of randomness on the part of this pattern, then you can predict using what's called mean field theory in, in physics, in statistical physics, that the uh, random walk should be biased by exactly a quarter of a cell per step. And so I think this is, um, uh, but it turns out it's not exactly that. And this was a sort of attempt to, um, to compute what it really was. And I think, yeah, Dick Feynman was a good calculator. I can't do any of these kinds of uh, working it out by hand, but that's, um, that's computing after several steps. That's computing the sort of probabilistic estimate of what you should get. And I think that's, um, that's another one of these probabilistic estimates of how the rule 30 um, uh, random walk should go. Um, as uh, um, uh, as as a function of um, 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 uh, as a, uh, as uh, as as it goes down the page, you know, I was thinking of making a, a little scrapbook of um, uh, of Rule Thirty because I realized that, um, and I know I need to put this. Um, I know I need to put this in the scrapbook. Okay, so that's a little bit, that's kind of um, some of what I wanted to say. I mean, there's, Rule 30 has shown up in all kinds of funky places. Like, for example, one of the fun ones recently was um, uh, this train station in Cambridge, England, that has uh, metal plates that are in that um, arrangement. And turns out that arrangement, um, there's a zoom in of the photograph, that arrangement is exactly the right-hand side of Rule 30, this kind of diagonal image of it. It's kind of fun. So um, that's that's uh, that's what that train station pattern. I haven't yet seen this thing in the flesh. I, uh, eventually, I'll, I'll visit Cambridge, England, and I'll see the, the metal Rule 30. Um, but uh, so, you know, when it comes to these problems, the... Um, it's really very unclear how to approach them. One could, we can talk about some different approaches one might take. Um, I think one of the things that's a conceptual question is, uh, could they ever, is there any way these, these questions might not have answers? Is there any way that there might just be no way to answer these questions? Well, it would be exotic, but it is conceivable. Um, and... Uh, the the main way that it could fail to be answerable is well these are questions about sort of infinite behavior and whenever you have a question about infinite behavior you have to use kind of theorem proving methods or you have to prove theorems you can't just say well well I, I, let me qualify that for example for problem 1 if it turns out that after a quadrillion steps Rule 30 suddenly becomes periodic, the center column suddenly becomes periodic, then you could just compute a quadrillion steps and know that that happens. So for example, the way that could work is let's say this, this random walk here, suddenly things conspire in such a way that the random walk no longer goes off to the left, but starts walking chunk, chunk, chunk over the center. And eventually this, this uh, repetitive behavior on the left-hand side takes over the whole pattern. I think it's extremely unlikely that would happen, but it's not impossible. We can't prove that that doesn't happen. So one thing we could do is just compute long enough that we can actually see it happening, and then we've got our answer. Now, there are, but in most cases, there's no explicit computation that would answer one of these questions. So instead, we have to have a proof. We have to have something where we start from axioms and we say, from these axioms, we can deduce, like Euclid deduced things in geometry, we can deduce what's true. And so one of the bad things that could happen is we think we know some reasonable axioms for mathematics. For example, the axioms of arithmetic, counter arithmetic, or the axioms of set theory, things like this. But it could conceivably be the case 
that this is a mathematical question that just doesn't have a definitive answer based on the axioms that we normally use uh, in in mathematics. So that's a way that the that the answer to one of these questions could be, well, uh, it depends what axioms for mathematics you use, what the answer is, which is a very weird possibility. But it means you just can't reach. We don't have a way to prove from axioms. It doesn't say that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just saying we can't reach it using methods of mathematics. Okay, so questions. So someone is asking on the live stream, do I have a guess how much time will pass before any of the questions get an answer? You know, it's funny. Somebody who works with me just sent me email like five minutes before this, this, um, uh, uh, this live stream started saying he thinks that maybe he's got a way to answer. Let's see, which problem is it? Uh, it's either number one or two. I'm not convinced, but um, uh, let me see. It's um, so, you know, it is conceivable there might be um, a, a quick answer. I'll be very surprised. My guess is that the first question, does it, does it ever become periodic? That that's the easiest of these to answer. Um, we know, for example, that no pair of columns can ever become periodic. No pair of, uh, of adjacent columns can ever become periodic. And that's kind of a, that's actually a fairly easy thing to prove. Um, and that's kind of a, you know, so it's like we're, we're homing in. And we can prove that not only can no pair of columns ever become periodic, a single column and sparse other cells to the left or right of it that combined thing can never become periodic. So I think that this is kind of within sight. I mean, this could be, this problem one could be cracked in a month if we're lucky. Um, and, uh, you know, for pi, proving the rationality of, the irrationality of pi, I don't remember how many centuries that took. It was a little harder, but it's a different kind of problem. It's, it's sort of qualitative the same, but not in detail the same. But so I think that one is, might be reasonably easy. Um, these other two are pretty hard. Um, now, you know, in the subject of hard problems, about um, in 2007, I put out a prize for about a Turing machine. So I had discovered that um, I'd enumerated possible Turing machines, and I'd found that the simplest Turing machine that behaves in a not obviously simple way is this particular two-state, three-color Turing machine. And I had a conjecture based on this principle of computational equivalence that I think is a really important, very general principle. I had a conjecture that this Turing machine will be a universal Turing machine. And uh, that conjecture, so I put up this prize. And in that particular case, it only took four months um, to, get, um, uh, to get an answer. It took a little bit longer to sort of uh, nail down the answer. So this is... Um, uh, let's see, we've got, um, uh, you know, this was the, um, um, uh, this was the result in that case. And you can see, this is not an entirely short thing. And it, it contains, you know, computerized proofs, and it contains a lot of detail and so on. And you can see the thumb there. So it's keeping on, it's keeping on going and going. And it's, it's a, it's a pretty long and elaborate proof. Um, and that's, I, I don't know what, the length of the proof for some of these things might be expected to be. I mean, in the subject of things that take a long time to prove, um, people might have noticed um, in, uh, uh, let's see, a um, um, recently, let's pull it up here. Um, the, um, uh, let's let me pull it up, here we go. Um, there was a, I, I tweeted about this. In the in the NKS book, there's um, a um, uh, I list some Diophantine equations involving equations involving integers, and there are different kinds of equations. These equations involving cubics here, um, they uh, some of those equations were very simple to find uh, either to prove that there couldn't be a solution or to find a solution involving let's say seven digit numbers. But I couldn't find a solution for that Diophantine equation, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed minus 3. And in that case, um, the, uh, 
Uh, it turned out there was an equation found, a solution found just a few weeks ago using this kind of network of uh, about a million computers around the world. And that's the solution. It's this really, uh, these really long numbers. So that's a case, another case where sort of there is a solution, but you're right at the edge of undecidability. You, you have, you can find a solution, but it's a very complicated solution to find. So I don't know for these problems, I just don't know how hard they're going to be. Um, and uh, uh, I would say this problem here, the third problem, does computing the nth cell require at least order n computational effort? Um, that's one where we can start discussing, you know, how would one, um, uh, how would one um, even think about formulating that question? And for example, one thing we could say is, well, let's ask: Does there any Turing machine that we can construct that will successfully compute? Uh, the the nth bit in the sequence without going through at least order n steps. But we could make it a little less than that. We could just say, let's run a Wolfram language program. And even with all the primitives that are available in Wolfram language, um, could we, given the actual implementation of Wolfram language, could we get something that runs in less than linear time? Um, the... Uh, um, Okay, someone anteater of power is asking on our live stream, why rule 30 over other rules? Well, it's my favorite. And the reason it's my favorite is uh, if you look at all of the simplest rules, uh, that um, all the simplest cellular automaton rules. So this rule here, there are, um, you can see there are eight bits here and each bit can be either black or white in the result. So that means there are two to the eight or two hundred and fifty six possible rules. And we just go through and look at what do each of them do, just starting from a single black cell. And this is kind of a, a sort of classic experiment that I did a long time ago now. Um, and let's but we can redo it here. Um, super easy to do now. It was a little harder back in the day, although this has never been a particularly difficult program to write. But let's do it here. Two fifty five. Um, uh, there, uh, okay. So these are all the rules, and you'll see most of them. Uh, it's not difficult to answer the question. What do they do? I mean, some of them make nested patterns, but rule thirty is the first of the rules where just starting from a single black cell, the behavior is complicated and seemingly random. Another example is rule forty-five. It's a little bit less easy to see what's going on because it's it keeps on and making the background go from black to white. But if we look at rule 45, we'll see the same phenomenon of the center column being apparently random. My guess is whatever methods work for rule 30 will also work for rule 45. We can keep going. Another one that's, that's kind of cool and um, has uh, uh, complicated behavior is rule 73. Here, here are things that are just essentially mirror reflections of rule 30 and um, black white inversions of these rules and things like this. I mean, like, for example, we can look at rule 73, about which fairly little is known. I mean, I can show you rule 73 here, um, and we could compute the same thing for rule 73. So there are all the other ones that there really nothing much more happens, except for rule 110. It does some slightly different things, but it's not so interesting in terms of randomness. Okay, so there's rule 73, a thousand steps of rule 73. And you can see it looks kind of complicated there. But if we look at, um, here, let, let me, maybe it's a little clearer if I show just 500 steps of rule 73. Um, and you can see, oops, let me, let me make it so that it doesn't alias. I don't know what it's doing through the live stream, but, but um, uh, let's do this. Let's do pixel constraint three, ah, pixel constraint two better. Um, okay, so this is now showing two pixels per cell here without any anti-aliasing. And if we look at the center column here as a, as a sample of what it's doing, what we see is actually the center column here is not so random. Let, let's look at what it is. Let's take the center column of rule 73. Let's go down here and compute it. Um, 500 steps. And let's get just the zero at the center column here. Oops. Um, and 
Ah, that's not random at all. Just goes periodically zero one zero one zero one. I'm kind of guessing that if we look a, a cell or two away from the center column, um, it might get a little bit more complicated. I don't know. Let, let's take a look at what does that one do. So we can get some indication of that by just doing one of our accumulation plots. Um, and uh, this is kind of the random walk plot, two times that minus one. Um, hmm. Okay, so that actually a bad example because I shouldn't have used. Let me let me try doing it. Hmm. Well, what this is showing is that there certainly isn't. Um, I don't know what I'm going to see if I just look at that sequence. I've got zeros and ones pretty far separated here. Um, but uh, let's take a look here. If I just do accounts on this, um, then okay, I've got four times as many zeros as ones. So if I if I assume that, then and I do my list line plot. Uh, so what I do is if I say if, um, well, if I just say, um, ba -ba 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 -ba, I want to say minus a quarter and plus one. That should kind of even out the zeros and the ones um, of that plus one. That will give it, okay, and now I want to accumulate that. That will make um, it go down a quarter. So that should be about equal. Okay, there we go. Oh, wow. Wow, I didn't know that actually. So that's only one step away from the center column of rule 173. I'm actually surprised by this. It's really looking quite random. Let's take a look at more steps. Let's take a look at 2,000 steps there. Mm. Oh, that was only 200 steps. No wonder it looked simpler. Wowee. So at 2,000 steps, um, even just one cell away from the center column of rule, uh, of rule 73, we're already seeing good randomness, uh, fairly good randomness. Now, I, I'm curious here, if I go two steps away and I look at the counts, wow, let's go three steps away. Hmm. For some bizarre reason, at three steps away, it does the same thing. Um, so actually, when in doubt, look at what my book has to say about one of these things. So I now have to look up in the index rule 73. Um, OK, density oscillations, localized structures, properties of pattern from single cell, page 59. OK, that's dandy. Now, rule 73, OK. Let's see what I say here. Um, Central region of the pattern goes four cells every seven steps. Actually, I didn't know this. This is an interesting fact that um, from what I can see here, the, um, uh, I mean, I don't know for sure, but it looks as if, let, let's take a look at, I'm just now curious, if I go to uh, 10,000 steps, it's going to take a little bit longer to work out. Okay, well, not so much longer. That's 10,000 steps of, of um, the, uh, column one to the right of rule 30 in rule 30 and and we could go ahead and look let's look at that column and let's look at the counts there and see whether okay well that's pretty close to being a uh, ratio one to four of zeros to ones so i really don't understand that because i would have expected that if you have a periodic pattern in the center that that would sort of force the neighboring patterns to be similarly periodic. Let, let's let's just for fun, let's take a look at that question. So let's say we look at the center column here. We we look at the things from uh, let's say minus um, minus four to four. So that's going to be the just the center of this. And let's partition that in. Let, let's do a thousand steps here. Let's partition that in um, size 50 things. And let's go ahead and make array plots of those. So this is now slicing it up 
Um, and let's see what this does. Okay, so this is now the cells away from the center column of rule 73. We can see it's left, right symmetric. And so that's looking at what happens. And so what this is saying is, for whatever reason, it's kind of interesting it does this. Even though left and right are really random looking, the um, uh, what you get at the center column, sort of the convergence of the two sides, is periodic. And actually, to, to kind of test out what's going on, we could just say we could just say the the rule. Let's take a look at what happens if we look at the whole rule, the whole pattern, but we downsample it by a factor of two in each direction. Is this going to work? Can I just say downsample? Uh, does this work? Let's see. If I just say a thousand steps here, and I say downsample two two, and then I say array plot that. Is that going to do the right thing? Or is that going to try and do some very clever piece of downsampling? Oh no, that did the right thing. Okay, so this is now. Okay, so what we see there is it's really kind of random looking on either side, but there's kind of a black line in the center, and that is the periodic, uh, left right periodic thing. Um, I'm actually now quite kind of inclined to try running this. For it's probably possible to prove that the center column has to be periodic in this case. Um, okay, we got some other questions on the live stream. So, Vejero asks, I would guess random real probably uses sources of, of entropy like dev u random or something. Um, the uh, um, so uh, that's right for seed random, but not for random real, because random real, if we seed random real in the same way, you know, if we just give a seed here, we better have it be the case that random real produces the exact same sequence of numbers every time. So, I mean, if we say random real, you know, 30 numbers or something here, that's going to give a definite sequence of numbers. And if we seed it again the same way, it better give the same sequence of numbers. and the seeding is done by using hardware sources of randomness. And that's important when we, like, for example, actually, I'm now curious. Let's do this. Just for fun, let's say make a parallel table. So let's find out how many processors I have on my computer. Let's say process account, processor count, 12 processors. OK. Um, not totally shabby, um, but not. Um, could be more, but that's at least some number of, um, for my desktop computer, that's a, a decent number of processors. But if I say parallel table, and I say, if I say parallel table there, and I just say, um, you know, I just was to say seed random, oops, that was the wrong thing. Actually, what I should do is to say seed random, open close, and then I say random real. And let's do that in a parallel table for, let's say, well, let's just do 12, because we know that's the count of the number of processors. So what we'll see here, actually, no, I'm going to do 24. OK, so what we should see is it will start up uh, 12 local kernels, and it will now run them. And it better be the case that so each of those local kernels, oh, yeah, every single time I do this on every processor, even though it's happening at the same time, it is seeding it differently. And so we're getting a different answer. Okay. And even if even if I were to do that on my single processor here, and I were to just say table of the seed random random seed, then that's going to pick up hardware randomness and um, give us a different result each time. But um, normally, you seed the thing. Now, you're saying rule 30 is not an efficient source of randomness. It's actually very efficient. It takes only a very small number of, of um, uh, um, operations to compute the next random bit. And by the way, when you actually compute rule 30 in, in a computer, you can do it with word-wise operations. You can do it by just doing essentially bit XOR of bit OR um, to, uh, uh, to compute the, um, um, uh, 
to, to so that you're computing all the bits in the 64-bit or 128-bit word simultaneously. So uh, Robbie is observing that the left-hand side of Rule 30 is definitely not random. Absolutely, the left-hand side of Rule 30 we could probably compute it, but but here I I had I had uh, arranged it someplace up here that's showing the um, that's showing how it becomes periodic, and um, uh, the period increases. It it, um, uh, it stays period two for a long time, then it jumps to period three, I think, and so on. Um, in fact, we could we could go ahead and compute that if we want to. We could just say, uh, bah, 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 let me think about this for a second. How would I do this? I would take um, um, I would take this, and um, I would say instead of rotating right, um, I think if what I did here was to say take, um, yeah, I want to take the things that are all, comma, and then in this case, I want to take 100. I think this is right. That should give me, oops, if I didn't have this wrong. Um, that should give me, if I flatten it out, that should give me the bits uh, right uh, by the center column, I think. And so if I were to take this, oh, no, no, I, I'm sorry, I think it's 200, right? Is that right? No, so what I've got to do is take this thing here and I've got to sample it. Um, I got to sample this thing in the middle here. And so that thing in the middle is, oh, actually, if I were to simply say part that comma 200, I think I would get the right thing. Oh, 100 then, I want to get, that will give me the center column there. Okay, that, why isn't that working? That, oh, maybe I have to say 101 because I'm off by one there. Confused, I am confused. Um, let's see, this should be all, and then I want the column, uh, column, um, do I want column 201 here? Um, the, yeah, so I'm, I'm messing up here somewhere. Maybe somebody can help me. Um, what am I doing wrong? I'm looking at this and I could say, um, well, let's just say rotate left. Um, and here I could say rotate left hash comma 200 steps. So I think it's 200, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's the thing. Okay, so we're trying to compute the periodicity of these right hand, left hand sides. So if we do the following, if we say this, so let's do it. Okay, so here we can do that. And then if we transpose this, we will get those. And then for each one of those, we say find transient repeat. And let's insist that it repeats, let's say 10 times. Oh, and then let's say uh, length slash at that transit repeat thing. Okay. So this is showing us at the beginning there, those are the periods. So that's saying there's a transient of 23 steps. 
It's probably something up here. And then those second things there are the periods. So if I were to say, um, if I were to say last slash at that, oops, last slash at that, it would give me the successive periods of that uh, left hand side there. So you can see that it's it's approaching, it's it's getting bigger only rather slowly. Okay, so if I were to plot that, this is showing the progressive, you know, period doubling effectively on the left hand side of this pattern, and it's slow. All right, question is um, uh, about uh, Plurimorant asks. Um, what is the fastest way known right now to compute the nth bit in the rule 30 pattern? It's order n squared. The only way we know how to do it is to basically just uh, run, um, run the cellular automaton rule. Now, I'll show you a couple of things here. If there are some slightly more um, there's some things that might seem slightly more efficient, but they're actually not. So, for instance, if we look at uh, the thing as a Boolean function, we can say, let's combine together the Boolean functions at successive steps. So, at the first step, the Boolean function that we're using is given by a three-term Boolean function at as we have successive steps. So for instance, I was showing you at the very, very beginning here. Um, and I, as I mentioned, you know, rule 30 is, let's go down here. I think I had it here. Um, what we can do, let me think how to do this here, is, um, uh, so that's, that's the uh, Boolean expression that we get in, uh, I think this is in disjunctive normal form um, of ands of ors. So we can, if we say traditional form of this, it'll um, show it as, as ands of ors of nots. Well, it's actually ors of ands. Um, so now we can ask the question, if we do two steps of rule 30, will we get a simpler to evaluate function or will we get a function which basically takes both steps to evaluate it? And I guess what we could do, let's think how to do this. Um, well, we could just say one way to compute it is cellular automaton, um, and we want to do two steps. So we say nest of cellular automaton, comma, hash, comma, two. And then we apply that to all the one, zero, Okay, so that's going to give us, oh, yeah, that's going to give us the two-step evolution of the cellular automaton. So if we did it for one step, if we did this for one step, what we would get is the tuples Actually, there's a better way to do this. I'm being silly here. Yeah, I'm being silly. The best, best way to do this is to just apply the cellular automaton to for four. Let, let's, if we did it for one step and then we just showed the center cell, then this would give us uh, that. What the heck? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I have to say, show us just the thing after one step. Okay. And I think I might be able to get it to automatically flatten if I do this. Yes, okay. So that should be, if I look at rule 30, that should be the rule plot. Actually, if I say, yeah, rule plot of rule 30. That should be, did I mess this up? That's not encouraging. Um, what did I do wrong here? That's applying rule 30. S 
Darting. I am confused. Let's do this. Okay, so that is one zero, so that's the zero. What's that? What is that? What's going on here? Oh, oh, I know what's happening. Oh, how confusing. I think this will work if I were to do this. No. I'm not sure what's happening here because what I'm what I thought I was getting was the result. Okay, so if I do this, I get all those things. And then I think I, I thought I was just saying cellular automaton 30 applied to all of those is the evolution of each of these things. So Oh, that's right. Zero, 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 one, 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 zero. Okay, what am I doing wrong here? I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong here. But anyway, if I were to do this and I were to say um, part of that, comma, all, comma, two, I would get the that cellular automaton rule. Now, if I want to go two steps, I just say five here. And I say three here. And unfortunately, I have to say nest. That comma two applied to this. And that will give me the the two step. So there's two to the 32. Here there's, there's two to the three things. So if I convert that to from digits comma two, that will give me the Boolean function that is, so that Boolean function, Boolean function of that number comma five will give me the um, two-step Boolean function corresponding to rule 30. So I can then say Boolean minimize of that two-step Boolean function. And, um, uh, well, actually, OK, fine. Let's just do it. So there it is. It's a, it's a little bit complicated. Um, I could apply this to uh, variables, let's say, a1, a2, a3, a4, a5. But so this is what we get by, you know, let's make it traditional form. So this is essentially the combined two steps of rule 30 combined together. This is sort of attempting to um, uh, sort of find the Boolean function given by not just one step at a time, but two steps at a time. And because I've done this before, I know that it actually doesn't really work. It doesn't get any simpler. If I go, let's, let's really live dangerously and go four steps. And that would be five, seven, nine here. And so this is now going to give us, so that's a Boolean function. And if I say from digits there, that's going to be a Boolean function. So that's Boolean function of that comma nine. That's a nine variable Boolean function. And if we say Boolean minimize, which might take, this might be completely crazy. I don't know. Oh, no, it isn't. Wow, I'm impressed. Our Boolean minimizer is fast. So that's showing us what you'd have to compute to go uh, uh, four steps at a time in this. Uh, oh, actually, I made a mistake here. Um, that's not three. That should be five there, sorry. Um, not clear it'll make any difference, but um, uh, let's try it again. Didn't make any difference. So that's the minimum Boolean function that you need to go uh, sort of um, uh, four steps at a time in this rule, and it doesn't, it doesn't help at all. Um, are the right and left-hand side of Rule 73 really identical? Yes, absolutely they are. And I can prove that to you very simply because I just make a plot of the, I mean, I just make a rule plot and you can see that the 
the rule here is left right symmetric. So because it starts off from a left right symmetric initial condition, it's guaranteed to be left right symmetric in the end. Um, and uh, the um, um, so uh, right. Well, let's see. Any other questions or comments? I think we had some previous questions that came in um, that was sent in previously, which I could take a look at here. Uh, um, is there a 3D version? Well, you can make 3D versions. You can certainly make 3D cellular automata. Um, sure, there are 3D cellular automata that have complicated behavior. I mean, this problem, if if one's able to find a method for cracking rule 30, it will probably be applicable to a bunch of other cellular automata. Um, yeah, so Mr. D on, uh, was commenting that um, on the right-hand edge, the periods increase rapidly. We could do the exact same analysis that I did on the left hand edge, on the right hand edge, and yes, they increase rapidly, which means that that's kind of a suggestion that by the time you get in to the, uh, here we have these comments, um, by the time you get all the way, I mean, these are all diagonals, and the diagonals are simpler to analyze than the verticals. Um, but the diagonals do increase rapidly. I mean, I, I actually have a, a list of, of how much those increase. Um, uh, I think in here, on the right-hand edge, yeah, the period seems to increase exponentially with depth. I actually didn't give, wow. I, okay, so someone uh, here gave um that's nice the someone here gave the um successive um periods on the right hand edge of rule 30 i don't think i've i i'm i seem to remember computing this at one point um but those are nice results that that's some um, uh Um, let's see, the, the statement being made, um, this person tracked it out to 2 to the 16, um, which happens not too far in. But that would be a nice thing to put in the, um, uh, we've got um, a community section um, for people to post things about this. That would be a nice result. Uh, let's take a look at what's, what else is here. Um, okay. Uh, we're asking questions about what it means for something to be random. Well, yes, if you talk about algorithmic randomness, that is, what's the shortest program to compute the sequence, then rule 30, the rule 30 sequence is definitively not random because there is a very short program to compute it. It's just the program that runs rule 30. That's a short to state program. Just actually running the program may take a long time, but the program is short to state. So it's not algorithmically random. We, we don't know whether there are algorithmically random things that sort of our universe can generate. Um, but it's uh, uh, sort of a, an important mystery about the universe is whether it is capable of generating algorithmic randomness or whether somehow if we only knew how to do it, we could sort of compute everything in the universe just like we compute something like digits of pi or the center column of rule 30. <laughs> so, okay, let's take a look here. We've got pretty detailed thing here. Um, <coughs> okay, so uh, Craig on a on our comments has pointed out that certainly the whole of rule 30 isn't a random raster. Absolutely. 
there are absolutely correlations between, you know, if we generate a Rule 30 pattern, uh, how many Rule 30 patterns am I going to generate tonight? Um, let's just generate one here. Um, I'm going to get much faster at typing this particular thing. Um, let's uh, let's just generate it with um, pixel constraint, so that just makes sure that it won't anti-alias on my on won't alias on my. Actually, I need to pixel constrain it to two, for example. Oh boy, already too big. Okay, so if we do this, then every local region. Um, the the vertical column can be random, but certainly a patch is not random. And the reason a patch isn't random is because it's running this rule. So for example, if you had a bunch of black cells all lined up, then the next thing that will happen is that there'll be pure white cells. And then over time, the uh, um, the sort of the, the randomness from the outside will eat into this region of white. But it isn't the case that every... Uh, the two by the, the the blocks here. There are very few possible blocks because the only blocks that are possible are ones that follow this particular rule. So if we start off with some particular uh, sequence, and so so for example, we can we can figure that out empirically. Let's just take take this, and for instance, let's say we make um, in that pattern we partition it into let's say. I don't know, uh, five by five, no, let's say four by four blocks. And let's do overlap one. And then let me think what that's going to do. Hold on. Let me just make a smaller version of this just so I'm not totally confused. Um, that is making four by four blocks. What's the structure of that? That would be that thing. OK. Okay, fine. So I have to flatten it once, and then I will get, okay, so if I take this and I flatten it once, I'll just get a bunch of four by four blocks. And so if I do that, and I say flatten this once, now if I do a count of that, then this will count the number of different four by four blocks. And what I'm finding, what I'll find, is that the number of four by four blocks is definitely not always the same. And if I simply ask, uh, what's a good way to do this? Well, I could just do the values here. And I could just say histogram those values. That's not very convincing yet. But um, I think if I run this longer, um, uh, well, actually, let me do the following. Let's Let's do Let's say counts here, and let's just ask how many four by four blocks occur with non-zero frequency. Okay, so that's the length of the number of counts of the counts. So 320, but the actual number of four by four blocks that is possible is two to the 16. So of all two to the 16 possible four by four blocks, only 320 actually occur in the cellular automaton evolution because once you have the rind of the four by four block, the thing, the thing at its top and its left and right, you've completely determined the innards of the four by four block. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, um, question here: Is it possible to find some subsequence along the center column that does not exhibit the same kind of randomness as the whole center column. That's a perfectly good and interesting question to which we know absolutely no answer. Yeah, I mean, clearly, so one question would be, could there be periodicity in the center column that is rare periodicity, like one in every 128 bits is always a one? I don't know. Good question. It's a good question. Um, we could test for that by doing, if we take, I think C4 was our list of the first 10,000 of these. I mean, this is pretty boring, but I could just take a Fourier transform of that 
and I could then take the abs of the Fourier transform and then I could just say list line plot of the abs of the Fourier uh, of that. That's pretty flat. So that means that in a good approximation, this is white noise. So what that means is if, if for example, every 15 cells was suddenly uh, a um, um, you know, w uh, suddenly had uh, um, was more probable to be black, for example, then this would show definite structure. So, for example, if we do this, I know um, uh, if we take, for example, uh, if if we look at rule one ten. Okay, so if we look at rule one ten. Uh, starting off from a random initial condition, so random integer, uh, let's say 400 steps, let's say 500 down, and let's do an array plot here. Um, this has the feature that its background has some different periodicity. So if we did that same test here on, um, uh, on this, we could just say, Oh, I don't know. Let, let's just take all of them. Let's just flatten the whole thing out just for just for the hell of it. Um, and then let's do that same Fourier transform. So let's take this thing. Let's flatten everything out. So we're just taking every successive column. And now let's say um, abs of Fourier of list line plot. And, oh, great. Okay, let's make this a bit smaller. Let's say 100 by, I don't know, let's just do 100 by 100. Okay, so what we're seeing here, look at all that structure. What we're seeing here is all kinds of structure that's reflecting, um, in particular, I think there's a period 14 uh, behavior here, which we're seeing as, and I, I suspect if we do this, if we say plot range to all, okay, we're seeing a very big peak down there, and we're seeing these uh, these successive peaks here, which reflect the periodicity that we're seeing in that pattern there. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the egg plan, egg Igblan is suggesting building a lookup table like one does in Hash Life, for example. That won't work here. The point is that in Game of Life, uh, most possible uh, configurations of cells do not occur because most of the time, I mean, if we make a typical, you know, let, let's say we just do an evolution here, we say Game of Life, and then we say random integer. Uh, let's say one, and then let's say, let's make a, I don't know, 300 by 300 field of random things. And then let's evolve that for, let's say 200 steps. Okay, so this is gonna give us a big thing. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that's a big thing. And now I think if we do image 3D here, we might see something reasonable. Yeah, look at that, isn't that cool? Okay, so let's make it bigger. And what we should see here, Look at that. There's some. Uh, well, actually, let me let me go and go ahead and do this. Let's say do it for 500 steps, and then let me make that whole thing into an image 3D. Um, and then, of course, it's going to take longer. Okay, so that's the game of life evolving in 3D. So we're showing it in space time, right? And what you see down here. Still not really okay. What you see down there at the bottom, you see a bunch of gliders running around. That's what those uh, streamer things are. But you see, most of the time, it's evolved to some fixed things, and most of the uh, most of the field is just white. So most of the blocks, the n by n blocks of cells, do not occur. So that means the entropy of um, uh, is is low, and that means that it is a big win to say, well, don't bother to evolve that n by n block of cells. Um, we can just know that an n by n block of zeros stays zero. The problem in rule 30 is you'll never get a speed up from doing that 
because every possible, um, uh, not n by n block, but every possible block of length n in the pattern, when we when we have a pattern like this, uh, in the horizontal uh, thing, we can uh, the it is a we don't know for sure, but it appears that every possible block occurs, and in fact with equal frequency. We know if we start the thing off from a random initial condition where every possible block occurs with equal frequency in the initial condition, then the same is true at every time step in the evolution of the system. Um, okay. So, yeah, so, so the hash life trick won't work. Um, let's see. Is that an inherent property of two-dimensional cellular automata that they have uh, low entropy like that? No, it's not. You can have perfectly well. You can um, uh, when you when you generate. I mean, if I just were to generate a random sequence of, um, uh, let's say, I do this. I just say, um, let's say, I generate. Um, let's say, I say, random integer. Oh well. I, I'd have to generate, you know what, the best thing to do is look at the documentation for cellular automaton because it'll show me how to do this. Um, and I say, let's say, multidimensional rules. Um, here's a typical cellular automaton after 30 steps. And what will happen is if I just generate, let's say I just generate the first, um, um, I don't know, let me generate the first 50 of those. This is now a slice in, uh, this is at a fixed time. And so you, you see all kinds of things happening. You don't see, uh, you don't necessarily see anything that um, uh, that coarsens out. These are these are just the um, uh, the spatial slices, well, the, 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 sorry, the fixed time slices of those patterns. And no, they, they don't, uh, many of them, are just like rule 30. In fact, if I look at a space-time slice through these, they'll look a lot like rule 30. So if instead of looking at the 30th step, what I do here is to look at, uh, let's think how to do this. I want to look at the slice. Let's think how to do this. Hmm. I'm going to look at 30 steps, but I'm going to look at the slice that is um, ba, 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 ba. the slice that is at the center. Ah, uh, I think it's this. Actually, if it's civilized, it will allow an all there. Let's see whether this works. So let's say we take this and we make that rule 42 or something just for good measure. Oh, wow. I think that should work. I'm surprised that doesn't work. If it doesn't work, it should work. Oh, let's see what happens if I do this. The spatial offset. Oh, 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 silly me. Okay, so I think it might be this followed by all. Um, there we go. Brilliant. So what this is doing is it's taking a space-time slice through the pattern. Okay. So each of these now, these are slices at a fixed time. What I'm now doing is I'm, I'm slicing the sort of pyramid that you get in the space-time. Uh, just, oh, come now. Wait a minute. Let me look at what this does. Um, I goofed somehow here. Oh, I see. Uh, I need to slice off, I think, one level of... What am I doing here? Oh, no, maybe it's this. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, so those are the sort of rule 30 analogs, the space-time diagrams that you get from two-dimensional cellular automata. And 
it's not that remarkable. They're very similar to kind of Rule 30 case. If I were to show it, kind of this is just one uh, slice. So if I were to show it, you know, the depth sort of in and out, um, I would tend to see it sort of have, I don't know, we could represent with gray levels the stuff that is further deeper in or, or further out. Um, it would look very Rule 30-like. Um, Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Any other, any other thoughts or questions here? Um, someone commenting that their formulation of algorithmic information theory might help with this. Um, that would be uh, that would be cool if it's the case. I, I'm I'm I I think. Well, as I say, that first problem about um, periodicity, I think, might be comparatively easy. Um, though I'm not counting on it. But the other ones I think are pretty hard. Um, and in a sense, the, the third one, to find out if there's a fast way to compute rule 30, um, you know, for the digits of pi, people believed that the only way to compute the nth digit was to compute all the previous digits and, um, uh, and get the nth digit. But then this really cool, uh, weird, series that works in certain bases like hexadecimal was found um, that uh, allows you to kind of more or less just dip in at any point and find, let's say, the trillionth digit of pi. I say more or less because there's actually a little bit of probabilistic stuff going on there um, that uh, uh, involves not allowing cascades of carry, carries to kind of pile up too much. But in fact, that doesn't, turns out even though you can kind of dive in and compute the trillionth bit, it still takes you of order a trillion steps because you still have to do arithmetic with length trillion numbers and so on. So you don't, you don't get to just sort of uh, go and sample the bit without uh, sort of paying your dues for a computation uh, if it's the nth bit of order, of order n. So that's... Um, so that's how that works. Um, it's, uh, yes, it's Simon Plouffe's um, amazing result. Simon Plouffe actually worked for our company for a while. Um, There's a remarkable story of a person who memorized digits of pi and um, uh, really was, was not schooled in fancy mathematics, but just noticed a lot of things um, and, uh, uh, and ended up coming up with this really cool idea that everybody thought was impossible. Um, it's a, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that might crack the problem three of the Rule 30 prizes is some insight like that, that just comes really out of left field. Um, I mean, the, uh, uh, we really know, you know, we know, well, I will be amazed if, uh, it turns out that there's a faster than n way to compute the nth bit in the rule 30 center column because it would imply that that is a computationally reducible computation, and I strongly suspect it's not. Um, I strongly suspect that, like many other kinds of computations, the only way to compute it is effectively just to run it and see what happens. Um, but we know very few examples of things that sort of look random, but are faster to compute than uh, um, than just evaluating each step and seeing what happens. I mean, clearly, if we have something like, um, uh, let's say we have something like this, um, you know, we can pretty easily go through and say here, oh, we can compute the value of the uh, of any bit in this pattern uh, much more efficiently than by uh, going and um, um, and just uh, uh, computing down to that level in the pattern. Essentially, what happens in this case? Well, let me show you a simpler case. In this case, um, the value of the nth bit is essentially the bit XOR of the coordinate position of that bit. So if I were to compute the bit XOR of, um, so let's say it's I and X and Y, and I were to make a table of the bit XOR, actually what I want to do is I want to say, 
table of bit XOR. Uh, let's see, if I want to say compute, let me try saying that equals zero, and then let me make the bool of that, which just turns it into one or zero. And then let me say, make a table of that, X goes to 100, Y goes to 100. And then let me, um, uh, and then let me say, make an array plot of that. Um, oops, 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 I did the wrong thing here. Do I want to do this? Maybe I want to say, humpfully hump. Well, let's just compute. Let's, no, that's not what we want to do. Let's, let's just compute the bit XOR value here. Oh, it looks like that. That's beautiful. Um, but now, um, the, uh, oh gosh, how do we work this out? Oh, it must be the, oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. It's the digits of that. If we say integer digits of that, in, so we're counting the digits of that in base two, and then we say bool of odd q of total of that, he says, which I could also do by um, computing. Uh, Okay, that's the total, that's the odd Q, that's the bool, which I could also do, oh, come now. Um, I could also do that, which one is it? Growl, growl, growl. What did I get wrong? I've goofed this up somehow. But anyway, you can kind of see from this picture that there's some reason to think it would look like that. Um, Okay, questions on the live stream. Do I suspect it's possible to get order n to the alpha with alpha less than two? Yes, I do. I think it's possible to get it pretty close to order uh, n. Um, because I think one should be able to use, well, I, I'm not certain, but I, 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 think, I think it will be possible to get it uh, less than order n squared. And that would already be an interesting result. But I'm, I'm predicting for, the, for just the center column, I'm predicting that you don't need to compute all the wings. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you could find, yeah, I'm saying if you could find, well, okay. If you can find an order N algorithm, um, no, it, it, it's not really, look, the real test of computational reducibility would be like, like if I could only get this right. Um, let's think how to do this. This is, am I just getting the function wrong here? Let's just take a look. Am I just confused here? Is it the bit or of those? No, come on now. I know it's one of these. I'm gonna be reduced to looking in my own book for this. Ah, well, uh, okay, when in doubt, look in the NKS book. Um, and let me just take a look here. Uh, um, methods for generating pattern from. Um, oh dear, well, that's, um, let's see, where is it? There's got to be one of these that gives the nth digit in the pattern. Um, oh, there it is, there it is. It's the bit and, let's just take a look here. See, I knew if I did enough of these, Okay, now what it's saying is it's the bit and um, okay, if I say one minus sine of bit and da da well, I got it slightly wrong here because that's gotta be one twenty eight. That's gotta be a power of two, let's say one twenty eight, one twenty eight and I've got it upside down, um, but there it is, there's the pattern. 
So what does this tell us? This means if I want to get the nth bit in this pattern here, then what I can do is I can just feed in the digits of x and y. Okay, so if I'm getting the nth row here, the the specification of the nth row is the digital number corresponding to n, which has length log n, log to the base two of n roughly. So in other words, what we're doing is we're computing here using log n steps, we're computing uh, the output. And um, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a beyond Sapinski Sapinski. That actually, instead of Sapinski has log to the base two of three fractal dimension, that has uh, log to the base two of a golden ratio fractal dimension. It's rule one fifty, as you can see. Um, all right. Well, let's see. Are there any other questions or comments? And um, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what people produce as an analysis of um, um, uh, uh, of these problems. And um, I'm really hoping that we'll see the, a repeat of what happened with the Turing Machine Prize in 2007, and it'll only be a few months before somebody uh, gets a result. I, I should emphasize um, the um, uh, uh, the the um, um, what happens? Um, you know, I should emphasize that I'll be amazed if there is a really simple uh, uh, proof of any of these results. I mean, in in uh, other than yeah, I'll be amazed. Um, I think uh, um. Yeah, Brian is asking, are there known cases of cellular automata generating true randomness? Depends what you mean by true randomness. Any Anything where the randomness is generated by rules, uh, it's not, quotes, true in the sense of algorithmic randomness, in the sense that you can always figure out what the bits are going to be just by running the rule. I think John von Neumann uh, had a quote that anybody who generates pseudorandom numbers, that is numbers that come from... Um, uh, of basically a computing a formula is in what he said, he, he said is in a state of sin, um, as in it's always going to eventually bite you. Actually, in the years since about 1984, when I, I first suggested rule 30 as a random number generator, the rule 30 random number generator is the only one that I know of that has survived all of those years without having had any non-randomness found in it. All other forms of all other random generators have had all kinds of weird uh, randomness. I mean, like, like for instance, if we take a good other source of randomness is, um, uh, let's say, powers of something, let's say powers of 57 or something in base, uh, let's pick a random thing in base, um, let's say base, well, let's just say base seven or something. If we say, um, uh, that that will generate for us a sequence. Well, actually, let, let's say in base um, in base seventy three, and then we're going to generate these. The first um, actually, what I'm going to use is power mod because it's slightly more efficient here. Um, I think that's the right thing, and goes up to a hundred. Uh, so that's generating those digits. Um, I don't know whether those numbers are good, but but um, anyway, that the let's take that and let's say, for example, um, let's take the last digit of that. So we want to say um, uh, mod two of that. So that's going to give us a sequence of zeros and ones. Well, that's a cruddy sequence. I don't think that's very random at all. But let, let's say say we take some some number like this. And we say, you know, that, so this is a very common way. This used to be a very common way of generating randomness was to use a linear congruential random number generator like this. And um, uh, so there are particular choices of numbers here that give a maximal length for their, um, before they repeat. Um, that's given, I think, by the Carmichael lambda function. Is that right? This gives the repeat time for those things I've forgotten. 
um, let's see whether we always a good trusty um, uh, linear congruential generators. Um, oh, this is talking about sources of randomness people have used. Um, yeah, I, I actually have to, I, I, I have a copy of this book. It's always fun. The Rand Corporation published in 1955, a table of random digits. Um, and uh, the thing that's really fun about that table, I actually have a copy of it. I could go fetch it and put it on my document scanner here. Um, what's actually particularly fun about that table is they published an erratum. Um, and so, you know, you might wonder how on earth was an erratum published to a table of random digits? The answer is they got that randomness from uh, electronic randomness in, I think, triodes, vacuum tubes. And they discovered that there were they were pulling out digits a bit too fast. And so there were small correlations between the digits, the successive digits that they pulled out. So this supposedly random table wasn't really that random. Um, OK, let's see. Yeah, you should. Uh, Iggy is saying he'll look at what Hashlife does. Yeah, absolutely look at it. I don't think it'll do anything, but you should look at it. Um, and uh, then, um, uh, Vejero asks, why did I decide to post this challenge now? You know what? I've been trying to get around to it for a long time. I almost posted this right after the Turing machine thing was won but I didn't get around to it. And um, uh, I then I thought about doing it at some anniversary of a discovery of Rule 30, but I don't know exactly when I first saw Rule 30. I think it was June 1st, 1984, that I first generated a high resolution picture of it. Um, but uh, I haven't really had a great excuse. Um, I Okay, I had a silly excuse. It was, uh, I'm getting totally ancient, so I turned 60 and I thought, gosh, I should do it. This is really corny for my 60th birthday because it's a 30 and a 60 and, you know, that's a factor of two and things like that. But um, that was that was my um, uh, most recent really corny reason for posting this now. But I've been meaning to do this for years and um, I've just, uh, just finally got around to it. Um, so, okay, well, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, Iggy is pointing out the low order bits of um, uh, of these. I mean, there's a there's a thing that's sort of an interesting an analog, which is if you look at the digits of uh, powers of three in base two, then you get. Let's see if I just make a table of those. The first, let's say. Um, um, 200 of these, and then I pad it on the left, and then I make an array plot. This should be, this is powers of three in base two, okay? So actually, at least in base six, that turns out to be exactly a cellular automaton. In base three, in base two, it's not, because there are carries that are long-range carries. But if you look at this, the linear congruential random number generator would pick off the right-hand edge of this. And you can see in this case, the absolute right-hand edge is periodic. And as you go deeper in, it gets the period uh, starts to increase quite rapidly. But that's, um, that's what you'd get. That's kind of the visual version of a linear congruential generator. And by the way, in terms of the fast computation question, the one thing, this is one example where you get a cellular automaton-like pattern. Um, but where there is sort of a skip ahead method, because if you want something to the power of 100, then one way to get a thing to the power of 100 is by repeated squaring. So you don't have to just go x times x times x times x 100 times. You can say, uh, let's compute x, x squared, x to the fourth, x to the eighth, and so on. And you can just keep squaring it up. And you only have to do about log to the base if you're taking it to power n, you only have to do about log to the base um, the uh, um, uh, um, uh, log to the base n um, uh, of those repeated squarings to get um, the thing to um, 
uh, uh, to, to the power n. Okay, so Iggy is commenting that we met. Since I don't know who Iggy is from the, the handle, that makes it very difficult. But we met at the APL conference in 1989 in New York City. I remember it well. Uh, it was a time when I met, um, uh, I think it's the only time I met Ken Iverson, creator of APL in person. APL was a, a, a great language um, that uh, uh, had a lot of great ideas about list manipulation and so on. And had um, it was a sort of cautionary tale for language designers because it had great ideas. It was a, a great sort of list-oriented sort of functional programming type language, and it had uh, a number of very ardent adherents. But it was not widely used. And one of the problems was that the notation. It sort of uh, actually Ken Iverson's idea. And I'm going off on a tangent here, but but Ken Iverson's idea was to sort of do for Mathematic for for do for computation for algorithm for algorithms what mathematical notation did for mathematics of finding sort of a standardized way to represent algorithmic operations. Unfortunately, it didn't work out with APL because people just weren't uh, couldn't really understand the boatload of weird operators that sort of got presented as ways to do. Uh, only certain kinds of algorithmic operations, ones with um, uh, with lists and so on. Um, but there were lots of nice things. I mean, there was, you know, whether it was grade up, grade down, which are, you know, sort and sort by, all these kinds of things, or, uh, you know, things like uh, our, well, our range uh, function was IOTA in APL. Um, actually, to show one piece of... Um, uh, I kind of can show one little little piece of trivia just for just for fun. Let's see if I can pull it up quickly. Um, if I go to the um, hold on, I think I might be able to find it. Um, ba, 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 ba. Uh, let's see. Let's see whether I can find this. Um, I am looking for the version one Mathematica book. Um, the online version of that full text legacy versions. Here we go. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Version one. Here we go. And now, um, look at this correspondences with other languages. And so there is APL. And so this is showing the correspondence between Wolfram language functions. Sorry, it's a bit old fashioned typesetting here, but that's what you get when the typesetting comes from. Um, uh, 1988, but this is um, um, this is the operators of APL compared to um, related uh, uh, functions in Wolfram language, and um, uh, that's kind of interesting actually. Encode and decode, yeah, we we now have better functions for this actually, um, and uh, um, we now have sort by for that. But otherwise, these are mostly the same. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, um, OK. Well, fascinating coincidence here. Um, oh, the, um, OK. Um, uh, okay, well, we're getting off onto other topics, and I think this is turning into a general AMA, which I think is is probably not the order of the evening. Um, but uh, uh, there's a question of how did I choose the delimiters for Wolfram language? They actually came from uh, my uh, earlier system, SMP, um, where I chose uh, square brackets to represent functions because I wanted to really have parentheses do their sort of mathematical, their standard mathematical grouping operation. And I figured that it was clearer to have square brackets. Uh, and, and you could do all kinds of nice things, like, for instance, um, being able to uh, actually have things like a paren x plus 1 mean a times 1 plus x, rather than having that be a function. and um, uh, that was that was why um, I wanted to use parentheses to very clearly de designate grouping and square brackets to designate um, um, 
uh, functions. All right, I think we should wrap up for the evening. I thank you all very much. Lots of fun stuff here. And um, go figure out why Rule 30 does what it does. Go solve these problems. This is some, um, uh, and um, I want to spend my $30,000. This is a great use of $30,000. Um, I'm, uh, I'm enthusiastic to, uh, uh, I have to tell you when I, when, um, when Alex Smith kind of um, uh, won our Turing machine prize, I was, um, uh, it was the happiest, uh, one of the happiest uses, perhaps, perhaps the single happiest use of $25,000 I've ever had. So um, uh, let's repeat that in $10,000 increments for the Rule 30 prizes. Okay, well, uh, uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, well, don't know where you, in the world you are, but uh, it's good night from me at least. Thanks a lot.